Detroit, Michigan, USA, the car capital of the world. All three of the global players have headquarters here, Ford, Daimler Chrysler and General Motors. In fact, GM have made the huge tower complex that is the Renaissance Center their very own. General Motors have generally steered clear of the wacky type of concept and have tended to adapt existing or previous models or create concepts that have a clear commercial future. File under sensible but not astonishing. The last Detroit show saw these concepts under the GM banner. The Chevy Bel Air, a two-door concept celebrating the 1950s classic look but with a 21st century power plant. A Vortec 3500 turbocharged five-cylinder engine delivering 315 brake horsepower. Retro is in fashion at the moment in the States and since Ford has found success from their new Thunderbird, GM are hoping for more of the same with this Bel Air. The styling inside is simple and even has a benched seat like the original. But whether this will pass safety regulations is pretty doubtful. And the seat belt anchor points will definitely mess up the clean lines here. It's affordable, it's a fun open air vehicle, it's all about fun, it's a fun exciting vehicle. With plenty of room uh, in the rear seat, enough room for four adults in this vehicle, or I can see a young family with their children in the rear seat. It's just. I just see it as this open air experience, it's just a lot of fun. If the Bel Air seems to be a test bed for a new engine, then so too is the Pontiac Roadster, a lightweight two-seater with a new 2.2 litre power plant. This is aimed at Americans who want the involved driving experience that most of us Europeans take for granted. It's got SHOCK, a manual gearbox which will be alien to most statesiders and the promotional blurb even describes the handling of this car as European. Now all the Americans need are a few demanding Alpine passes to try it out in. OK, here's a question for you. What's this got to do with uh, this? Let's look again. This and this. Well, the snowboarding theme was taken up by General Motors, who own Vauxhall. They made a concept based on the humble Zafira and called it a snow trekker. This was revealed to the world at Detroit in 2000 and to be honest none of us there were really that impressed because it seemed to be merely a squared up Zafira with some snowboards tacked on. How wrong we were! Little did we know that if we'd looked more carefully we'd have noticed subtle but important changes in direction. This concept car was taking Vauxhall. Changes which now we can see on the car being made as we speak in a huge factory on Merseyside. A car which will have besuited reps in, driving countless miles up and down bland motorways. They park the car at bland service areas and after eating an equally bland meal would do this before driving off again. Yes, elements of the Snow Trekker styling have made their way onto this, the new Vauxhall Vectra. The new Vectra looks like a baby with four or five different parents, if such a thing was biologically possible. Different elements of the styling remind you of different concepts. And that's my point here. Concept cars can wow the crowds at car shows, they can give top designers kudos and brownie points, but at the end of the day, their best ideas need to be melted down into future production cars, which hopefully will roll the cash back into the company. The new Vectra is General Motors' big hit against their arch-rival, the Ford Mondeo, and the design team has been virtually entirely British. So well done, chaps. A good job well done. One of the joys of going to car shows is getting into arguments with your mates over the outrageous concepts. Take the GMC Terra Cross. It could be a bold, adventurous statement for the 21st century, or it could be a shape penned by a 12-year-old. What do you say? This is GMC's rather funky-looking Terra Cross concept car, and it's one step on from the Terra Dyne concept car you may remember from the Detroit Motor Show last year. Now, they're hoping that elements of this will go on to reinvent the sports utility vehicle. Not another one. It's true that there are so many sharp lines on the Teradyne, it makes Ford's new edge design look decidedly bulbous. But call me old-fashioned, I thought that aerodynamically cars needed to have curves in them. Plus, the sliding door, it's a bit, well, 
minivan, isn't it? Let's get what the designers had in mind by speaking to the leader. We use the words industrial precision, and that really describes the look and feel of the vehicle. The form vocabulary, which refer to the shapes, the way we, um, the way the surfaces are treated on the vehicle, the intersections. We have harder edges, more beveled edges, uh, more of a mechanical, um, architectural type influence in the way the surfaces are constructed. Then we. Uh, cap the design off with brush metal details. Uh, the details such as the headlamps, the wheels, things like that are again mechanically influenced. Uh, so you have a very, uh, very clean uh, contemporary look to the vehicle. The bizarre lines of the Teradyne might be at home in Europe. After all, they sell the Fiat Multipla over here, don't they? Could it be Europe bound? Obviously this vehicle, especially for GMC's uh, portfolio vehicles, is uh, very efficiently sized, which is something that may lend itself to to more of the European needs. It's not a, a, an overly large SUV or truck. It's a very efficient and agile. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, it could be applicable to Europe uh, down the road. I'd be very surprised if this complex angularity ever makes it into mass production. And besides, a supercharged V6 engine is never going to win any green awards in Europe. It's difficult to imagine a time when concept cars didn't exist. These mainstays of the show circuit have become as commonplace as electricity and indoor plumbing. But in 1938, the idea of creating an expressive automobile to explore new worlds of design and technology may have seemed as fanciful as spaceflight. General Motors was the first manufacturer to take this step and the result was the Buick Y-Job, a car that's widely acknowledged as the industry's first concept car. This was the actual car driven by GM Vice President of Design, Harley J. Earl, through the streets of Gross Point, Michigan, on sunny summer afternoons, just to get the reactions from the punters. Brought over to the UK to star at the Goodwood Festival, you have to admit, even if you don't like it, it's astonishingly different from anything else from the late 1930s. Harley J. Earl was the catalyst for the creation of this unique automobile. Colourful, charismatic and opinionated, Earl left his mark on generations of GM products. The Y-Job was a signpost that pointed to design trends that would endure for decades. They created a vision that inspired a new genre of automotive art, the dream car. With a 126-inch wheelbase and a body that extended more than 17 feet long, the two-seat convertible was an exuberant expanse of streamlined sheet metal. Sporty yet elegant, the Y-Job introduced innovative features such as concealed headlamps, electrically operated windows, flush door handles and a power-operated convertible top that was fully concealed by a steel boot when retracted. Wow! But it was the Y-Job's long, low profile that left the impression that this was a time machine from the future. Gone were the running boards and formal upright shapes of the classic coach builders. In their place, the Y-Job had fenders that flowed seamlessly into the doors, integrated bumpers that complemented the bodywork, and strong horizontal styling elements. It introduced themes that would reverberate throughout the automotive industry through the 60s. While contemporary road cars rode on 16-inch wheels, Earl specified special 13-inch diameter rims to give the Y-Job a lower stance. The small diameter wheels were backed with airplane-inspired finned brake drums that were more than a match for the Y-Job's 320 cubic inch, 141 horsepower inline eight-cylinder engine. Why the Y-Job name? In Earl's lexicon, every new project was a job. The letter Y went one step beyond the prosaic X for experimental designation and paid homage to the prototype fighter planes that were identified with the prefix Y by aircraft manufacturers. So there you go. A good job well done. General Motors have had Saab as part of their group for some time now and we're very pleased to see this headline-grabbing concept appear at the 2002 Detroit show. For the first time, Saab designed a vehicle to go off-road. And why not? Volvo went that route years ago, and this 93X is called a crossover coupe, a four-wheel drive vehicle that combines off-road capabilities with sporty appeal. 
On first glance, it looks the part with the sweeping wraparound windscreen. And one look under the bonnet at the 280 brake horsepower V6 turbo engine, and you know, this car means business. We don't do concept cars for the sake of having concept cars. I mean, both cars are a clear statement. This car is more, let's say, much more a vision of the future. And uh, let's say the 93X is much closer to reality, but it's still a concept car. Other features on this concept include an advanced infotainment, don't you hate that word, system. And this has dual display screens inside. Plus, there's an automatic sliding cargo floor, which seems quite adaptable. But maybe over-egging the pudding, if they got rid of the electric motor, we'd have more storage space, right? Or am I missing the point here? This concept is important for Saab, as GM wants them to double their annual production volume, and the 93X is the first of a new wave of an aggressive model product plan. As we were, so to speak, you can say a small company, a small company can't survive in this, uh, this business uh, to rely on, on your own uh, R&D and so that, that's not possible. We have, of course, to have a big, uh, big mother company that is supporting us with the technology development and so on, so uh, that's, uh, that's a prerequisite for our future success. Bob Lutz used to be a Chrysler car guy, but now he's a big cheese at GM, and he supports Saab all the way. Today's Saab vehicles are right on in every category, and they are true to Saab's unique and powerful character. At GM, we are fiercely protective of that Saab character. Our goal is to help provide Saab with the environment and the resources needed to make the most of its tremendous future potential. I must say this concept has been carefully thought out with ingenious glass panel systems which can slide together or be taken out if need be. And a telescopic tailgate which expands 8 inches on demand, allowing for bigger cargo loads. Inside an advanced data and information centre and fibre optic headlights are aimed to be standard features on future production models. If they do it, the concept you're looking at will be the start of a design renaissance at the company, and about time too. Saab has been far too conservative for too long, and it needs to show some flair again. If Volvo can do it and not lose current loyal customers, Saab could do it as well. And the 93X is a good pointer to the future. Well, what you see today, uh, at least in the front volume, in the, in the bonnet, in the front, uh, in the face of the car, it's, it's almost the same as uh, the future production 93. Uh, we have, of course, for the concept car, we try to be a bit more uh, adventurous with the details and, and all that. But, uh, and then also on the interior, uh, the design of the dashboard, the volume of the dashboard is almost exactly identical to production 93. That's all for part one, but here's a glimpse of some of the concept cars we'll be featuring in part two. If you fancy the opportunity of designing a car but don't necessarily want a full-time job in the profession, sometimes these things do happen. Here in Detroit at the General Motors headquarters at the Renaissance Center, somebody came up with a bright idea of asking the general public what they really wanted. Yes, what they really, really wanted with their new cars. Say, I got an idea. Why not ask the general public here in America to design our next automobile? Well, this was a bad idea. B.A.D. After countless focus groups, discussion forums and questionnaires, the concept car was unveiled to gasps all around. It must have been like that scene when Homer Simpson designed his own car with all the daft add-ons. This was the car the public all wanted. But they'd created a monster. The end product, the Pontiac Aztec, is a bizarre mix of styles and shows what can go wrong when a car is designed by committee, especially a committee of non-car designers. Some people must have wanted lights up high and others wanted the lights low, so they bowed to both views. Some wanted rubbing strips, some didn't, and so on. The result is, at best, well, ugly. But just to show they hadn't made a mistake, Pontiac actually produced the concept. And amazingly, it has sold quite well in America. Probably by all the people who are in the focus groups who can now brag to their neighbours that they helped design their new car. 
So with the ugly Pontiac Aztec actually being driven off showroom forecourts, maybe the car is simply very practical but not a looker. A bit like Europe's own misunderstood wonder car, the Fiat Multipla. Since the 1950s, when it was considered that oil was eventually going to run out, thought had been given to electric power. After all, electric cars would be clean, quiet and superbly suited to the jet age and the space age to come. Never mind that the electricity would have to be created in a smelly, dirty, inefficient power plant still probably burning oil, but that's another matter. Apart from a few bizarre concept cars, nobody had thought of creating a production electric car. Who would buy them apart from a few green-thinking hippies or people who had very short trips to make? Plus, the concept cars were filled with huge lead-acid batteries and nobody had thought of a better system to power these cars. But the big car companies were coming under pressure. The environmentally friendly states of America, such as California, were pushing through all sorts of laws about car emissions and it was clear that if a car company could bring out a green car here, a huge amount of kudos could be gained. And so it was that the car of the future was unveiled by General Motors in the mid-1990s. This was the EV1, General Motors' first totally electric vehicle to be sold as a production model to everyday punters. We've all heard the comedian's gags about the electric car which couldn't go further than the end of the road because that's how long the electric lead was. But range of electric cars is a very important factor. With the EV1, General Motors worked out how far people could expect to drive under certain conditions. For example, if you were going up hills a lot, using the air conditioning on full, plus with the stereo on very loud, you were going to use a lot of juice, which would limit your range. On an average daily of 72 degree highs, with the air conditioning units off, driving on flat roads, the range at about 55 miles an hour would be about 90 miles. So if you were to drive somewhere, say, 46 miles, you'd be kind of worried on the way back. The heart of the EV1 is the power inverter module and the three-phase AC motor. An alternating current motor is much more efficient than a DC one. So when you charge the car from the AC main supply, it gets stored inside as DC. Then, to use the power when you drive the car, it gets converted back to AC to drive the motor. This motor uses reduction gears to bring power to the front wheels. And note, there's no transmission on this car. Actually, there's loads of things you don't have to worry about. After all, an electric car never needs an oil change. It does have a radiator to keep the batteries cool in very hot conditions. But the less parts, the less hassle, in theory. But just think about that dead weight you're lugging along. 26 12-volt lead-acid batteries all connected up. OK, the batteries are 90% recyclable and there's no battery acid slopping around as the acid is encapsulated in absorbent mats for safety. But the owner of the EV1 would find a very small boot and cramped conditions inside because so much space has had to be found for those pesky but essential batteries. General Motors even had to get rid of the spare tyre and put on self-sealing tyres with pressure monitors connected. These tyres are a good idea, but would make the performance of the car even worse. So, how do you charge up an EV1 car? You simply brought the charging paddle into the front fascia. It uses an interactive system using magnetic fields, a bit like the electric toothbrushes we have. In other words, there are no direct electrical contacts, so it's really safe, particularly in wet weather. When you're at home, or at a proper charging station, it uses a big 6.6 kilowatt system which can charge up completely in about three hours. However, if you have to use the little onboard portable system which plugs into any electrical outlet, it can take 15 hours to fully charge. 15 hours is a very long time. And if you had to use the little charging system, say when you're staying at a motel in the middle of nowhere, you just wouldn't be fully charged after your sleep. You might be fully recharged, but your EV1 certainly wouldn't be. As you can realise, there are a lot of negatives to the General Motors EV1 car, and this is probably why so few of them have been sold over the last four years, when they've been on sale in California and parts of Arizona. The only real positives, apart from helping the environment, is that it is quite a fun experience to drive. 
Forget the performance, forget the handling. Just enjoy the feeling behind the controls as you drive along a car that is like none other. It's almost like flying, playing with the kind of controls and displays you have in front of you. Because the engine's so silent, you even have a special pedestrian alert alarm, the kind of soft horn to tell them you're coming. One gadget that is quite neat is the air conditioning. When the car is connected to a charger, you can set a time so that the air conditioning comes on just before you're about to get into it. A great idea for a very hot day. When you're on the road, though, you have to learn a new way to drive. There's a coast down control, which slows you down like you would going into a lower gear on a conventional car. However, it actually turns the electric motor into a generator to recharge the battery. The system automatically kicks in when you put the brake down. So the EV1 was a very brave move for General Motors, who must have lost a fortune on this car, but someone had to do it. If only the technology were available to make electric cars cheaper and more efficient with batteries that were light and small. The reaction from the great American public is that electric vehicles are just too much hassle at the moment. Even if the owners loved the EV1 car, there were apparently too many problems with the public charging stations which were forever breaking down. What someone needs to invent next is a much more efficient charging unit that works from the mains at home. And Volkswagen have decided to adopt an AC charging system which they claim costs less and performs better. Watch this space. Next week on Concept Cars, join us for another journey of exploration through the creative brains of the world's top car designers.